Good morning, and welcome back to a special edition of The Roundtable. I know I promised you guys that I was going to do a roundtable platform discussing giving the entire hour to what's going on in Ferguson, Missouri. But I want to give a special first on just my take of some of the things that are going down in Ferguson and in other places where black men are being brutalized by police. Now, the reason why I'm giving this special is I just had a roundtable discussing police brutality and domestic violence. The last brutality that I discussed was Eric Garner getting the chokehold by the police officer in New York City. And he died from his, from his wounds, or from the chokehold as a man, as it were. Um, today I come to you about another story that's just, just tearing the country apart. It's, it's on every paper, it's on all the internet, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and that's Mike Brown. Now, I'm coming to you from two perspectives here. I've been talking to a friend of mine that happens to be a police officer, and they have a different opinion upon this, and uh, I, I, we don't agree, of course, but it's like I said before, I'm not here to destroy policemen. I am here to try to, I'm here to speak from the people. I, I am one of those who have been harassed by the police, so I know of what I speak. Um, I think sometimes when black people put on that suit, they can forget about the harassment that goes on with our people. Um, I know that some people in, in the uh, police uniform are trying to do good, but what I'm saying is I don't see that. I see it sometimes on TV as I watched uh, Ferguson uh, just the other day and it showed uh, a kid, a little black kid out and a, a, a little white cop, you know, playing around with him, uh, dancing, they were doing dance moves back and forth. That's nice and that's cute, but that kid's little. See, when he gets about 13 and 14 and 15, that same cop might. I'm not saying will, I'm saying might. So I look at him as a target instead of as a child. And that's the problem that we have. This is a systemic issue that's going on in America today, and that's what I would like to talk to you about. So let's get back to Mike Brown first. Let's go ahead and pull up the facts that we know. The facts that we know right now is Mike Brown was shot six times. Six times. A few times in the arm. I think it was four times in the arm, and he got shot in the eye and top of the head. Now, from what some of the medical examiners were saying, were, were because some people were saying that he got shot in the head because he reared his head down like this to charge the officer. That was what some people were trying to say. Not the medical examiner, but other people who were guessing around why he got shot in the head, top of the head. The medical examiner I saw stated that that's highly unlikely. Number one, he wouldn't have been able to see where he was going. Number two, the way it hit him, the bullet hit him, uh, it seemed more as if he was falling than as if he was charging the officer. But this is speculation. What we do know is that Mike Brown was shot six times, three or four times in the arm, one in the eye, and one in the head. Now, from reports of witnesses say that the cop was trying to drag him into the car by his neck to him pulling away, to him running. The uh, report does show he was not shot in the back so far. The first autopsy shows he was not shot in the back. But this does not change the fact of what the other witnesses were saying that he did stop, turn around, put his hands up. Now, from, from what I understand, when you put your hands up, that's surrender. And he also said, don't shoot, his friend said. Now to continue shooting, that's called excessive force. To this particular police officer I'm speaking of that is a friend of mine, that's called excessive force. If I put my hands up, that means I quit. That means give up. So police officers, you can do one of two things. You can come and take that time to cuff me, or you can, call, you can tell me to get down on, on the ground, on, the, on my belly, or you can call for backup if you think there's too much for you. My cop friend also said that you never know the situation, Lee, unless you're in it. You know, sometimes you get panicked. What if some, some guy did that to you and, and, and you're just gonna pull out and shoot to get that person off you? Your adrenaline is moving and this, that, and the other. Okay, well, I have another answer for that. Policemen are taught things that people on the street are not taught. 
You're taught hand-to-hand -hand combat. You're taught to handle these situations, these particular situations. You're taught how to handle these situations. You drill, you drill, you drill, you drill, you drill. We're not taught this on the street. We're not taught how to combat cops. You are taught this. And if all else fails, what else do you have? The ultimate neutralizer. Actually, you have three. You have a baton, four, baton, pepper spray, a taser, and a gun. And these Glock that people carry, I'm sorry, unless a man is on some kind of drug, they'll stop you. I don't see people running into you when you got a Glock pointed at them and you done shot them a couple times. I don't see them keep coming, keep coming. I, I don't see that. Maybe I'm wrong, but this is my personal viewpoint and opinions. Now, as I said before, this cop friend of mine was saying that you never know what you're going to do, you panic or whatever. Well, here's the thing. If you're a policeman, if you've been trained and trained and you continue to panic under strain, when you have been taught hand-to-hand -hand combat, maybe you should try another profession. Maybe this profession is not for you. I definitely think that there needs to be more comprehensive training as far as black and white relations and getting to understand the black community more than just assuming that we're targets because it's just not the case. Okay, now once again, the facts where he was shot six times, we know that. The rest are people speculating. Uh, I'm glad that the president is bringing in the uh, DOJ, the, uh, the Department of uh, Justice. I'm glad they're bringing the FBI in. This needs to be done. I'm glad that, I, I really am. Um, another problem with this is leadership. We had a fellow on the show, Chad Bumgarner was on the show talking about leadership and things of that nature before. Another problem with this is leadership. I mean, it almost seems that the captain of the police department and the other people, uh, the cops surrounding this issue was trying to protect the officer. Why would we need to protect you if you did nothing wrong? That, that's what I understand. The Department of Justice told the captain of this police department not to release the videotape. Everybody knows the videotape by now, right? And this is the alleged robbery of, of, of Mike Brown stealing something from a store. Now, they call it robbery. Shoplifting is what it was. Um, and like I said, we still don't know it was him. Like they said before, that is his likeness. But until we, until we get a confirmed judgment on him, it's a legend. Now, he put out this against the Department of Justice, you know, telling him to put it out. He put it out, for what reason, we don't know, and then said it has nothing to do with the crime. So what happened in that store had nothing to do with his officer shooting Mike Brown, so why put it out? Well, I'll tell you why he put it out. He put it out to prejudice the people watching television. Because if he can get the so-called majority right now, white people, um, and maybe even some black people who think in the same fashion. If he can prejudice them to, to, to say, I knew there was a reason that cop shot him. I knew it wasn't just for nothing. That black guy had to be doing something. I, I, I knew it. Even though the police officer that shot Mike Brown had no idea of what went on in this store and was not responding to that, so according to him, Mike Brown, just a black kid walking down the street, that he stopped. So he had no idea. But why put out the videotape? Another question. Why put out the videotape? And then say it had nothing to do. You were trying to prejudice the people who have been watching TV who have been tearing your police officer to shreds. And then by doing so, you gave yourself another riot. That's not smart. It's not smart. You're lacking leadership in Ferguson. You're lacking leadership. That department needs to be dismantled. You're lacking leadership. If the head of the police department is showing that kind of venom, then the whole, then the whole department needs to go. I'm sorry, those are my thoughts. The whole department needs to go. I'm sorry, that's just, that's just my thought on that. Ferguson is on fire. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of peaceful demonstrators that are doing the right thing there. And then there's some people who are going to take advantage of that. They're going to do what they want to do and everything else. But here's, here's one thing I have to say, even about the rioters. You know, yes, they might be taking this, this, this time to use Mike Brown's death. I say murder. Um, 
as a chance to do some get back for themselves because they have been harassed, they have been this, they have been that. We just didn't catch it on tape. I understand. Even Martin Luther King said, you know, he might not have agreed with writers, but he understood that they were just voices that were unheard. We rioted before. This is nothing different. Look at the peaceful movements we had in the 60s. Cops still chases down with dogs and water hoses. But then they tell me, my friend the cop tells me, hey, I think you're jumping too hard on the cops, you don't know the situation, you don't know this, that, and the other. I'm just saying, look at all the facts of this, that, and the other. What I would tell my cop friend, and to all cops, who I'm not, you know, against all cops, if you're good, you're good, that's fine. Keep doing the good work. But what I would tell you to tell your brothers in blue who are not doing the right thing is, you know, this gives you all a black eye. This makes you all look bad. It makes it look terrible. The sad part about this is not just Mike Brown, but this has been going on for decades. It's just now that we have the technology to capture it on tape. And then they ask, oh, why tear down, you know, your area and this, that, and the other? I, I, I don't know why they tear down their own areas. I mean, they're just angry and they go at it. I go to some place where they, it would hurt somebody else, you know? Take it to the rich area, take it to places over there and leave. Don't destroy your own areas. I agree, it's, but sometimes you just get angry and it explodes. Just like it happened when Rodney King. It had been going on for so long, and then it just erupted with Rodney King. That's what's going on right now in Ferguson. They're taking it, they're taking it, they're taking it, and then it just explodes. And this is the things that happen. We have to start doing more. Now people say, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, my friends said the same thing, what are you doing? Well, I'm here giving you advice. I can tell you, you want to know what you can do to make it better, people? Because marching sometimes will do the trick, and sometimes marching won't. We need to fix legislation. You know, remember Mothers Against Drunk Driving? When they got tired of their sons and daughters and uncles and sisters and brothers getting killed by drunk drivers, what they do? They drafted a bill. Right? Is that not what they did? The lot of black mothers and fathers of victims of these children get together and draft the bill. I don't care what you call it. Quit killing our young black men. How about that as a, as a bill choice of a name? That would work for me. Stop killing our young black children. Because what people don't understand here is when it's black people, you know, we can take all day and we can go over the facts here, we can look at that there. If that kid would have killed that cop, this case would have been wrapped up in two minutes. That kid would have been taken into custody and it would have been all she wrote. This officer killed this kid and he ain't even been taken into custody. They're worried about his safety. Ain't that something? See, that's how it works when you're, in to, uh, when you're an authority figure. When you're an authority figure, you get more preferential treatment. But if that was you or I who had shot a cop, maybe even in self-defense, Maybe I had my gun on me legally and I felt I was being harassed and then threatened and then grabbed. Now, if I was to shoot this cop, do you think they would try to protect me or do you think that other fellow cops would come and blast me away immediately or take me downtown and book me for murder? Either way, I'd be in a jail cell. He is not. There's a problem with that. Put him in jail like you would do us and then we talk about it later. You don't put us in a safe house and then say, okay, what happened? That does, that does not happen to black people. That don't happen to us. Okay, now what we're gonna do is gonna get, on, we're gonna get on with the chief. We talked about the chief and how he released the tape and said how the, uh, and he said how the, um, it didn't have anything to do with the shooting. Now we're gonna move on guys to a couple other guys that you did not hear about that also were shot within a couple of days of Mike Brown's shooting that I wanted to give you guys a little bit of, um, wanted to give you guys a little bit of heads up on. There are two other shootings. Uh, is, what's his name? Ezel Ford, uh, walking down the street in Los Angeles. A 25 year old man with a history of mental illness. All we know that he was stopped by a cop and wound up dead. That's all we know at this point in time. Um, we know he was shot by two officers and we also know that he was unarmed. That's what we know. There's been protests, that, there's been a lot of protests that have, uh, uh, have uh, you know, jumped off in uh, California since then, protesting for, uh, protesting for this young man and um, 
there's a, 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 they, have, they have taken over the streets this past weekend about this young man. And uh, we also have another guy in Ohio, John Crawford, uh, was in a Walmart. <laughs> this, this, is, this is interesting. John Crawford was in a Walmart. Okay, he was in a Walmart. He had what I understand was an air rifle. Okay, which is what I understand really was not a real gun. Somebody called the cops saying that he was waving the gun around in the Walmart. Now, what we understand from his friend who was on television today was saying that he was talking to his, his, his girlfriend or wife, the mother of his children, when all this went down. Now, when the cops came and supposedly the cops said, we told him to put the gun down, he didn't, and we shot him in his chest. His friend said on television, he was on the phone with his wife or uh, the, the mother of his child and was probably unaware of what was even going on. They have guns that they sell in Walmart. He was looking at a gun, whether he was going to buy it or not. It was an air rifle. And without giving his attention, obviously enough, I can imagine being on the phone, you not even thinking, I got a gun that's not real. Here's some cops. Oh, it must not be me. I'm looking around like, what are they talking about, baby? I don't know what they're talking about. And next thing you know, when you do realize it, his friend said that he said it's not real before he was shot. And I don't know about you, you guys, but that, that's the kind of thing that makes black people not trust police. I'm sorry. How can you explain this? How are we that much of a threat on a glare? that you can just unload on somebody. Or even if you don't unload, shoot in the heart. And then, I mean, really? I mean, come on. Is that what it's, I mean, is, I can't even say, is that what it's come to? Because that's what it's always been. It's just becoming so more reported now that people are gonna have no choice but to stand up. And I, I, I encourage you black folks to stand up. Now, this is not a racial thing as far as I'm concerned against white people. This has to do with, with, with dirty cops and cops who have not been trained correctly. Because I guarantee you, I don't see you going out here killing white kids like that. And the moment you do, hey, mum's the word. I have not seen you out here killing white teenagers like that. I haven't seen you out here killing white men like that. And I'm sure there's white men at the local Walmart with, with shotguns. Not air rifles, but with shotguns, checking them out, loading them up, looking what they look, seeing what they look like. Look down, son. To you, that's probably just, hey, a guy checking out a gun for duck hunting. But the moment you see a black man with an air rifle, he's got to be killing somebody. I remind you, I will remind you, when you had those killings that went on in the movie theaters and all that other kind of stuff that was getting shot, that was not a black man. That was not a black man. I'm just saying this case of shoot first, shoot now, shoot later, they have got to be retrained. Well, who are you talking about retraining? I'm the, I'm the victim. I'm the one you're coming out of. I'm the one you're coming after. All right, guys, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back in a few minutes. we got to go pay some bills. Hi, welcome back to Phoenix 22 Rods and Productions update. Okay, guys, first I'd just like to say that um, the round table, the first initial episode, has gone great. It's been very well received, and I'd just like to say I appreciate all you guys that have shown me love, shown me support. It's going really well, and we have another uh, coming out for you right now. Uh, I'm going to do a personal special on um, Michael Brown and what's going on in Ferguson, Missouri. And then we're going to do a roundtable panel about Ferguson, Missouri. And get a little bit of feel from what everybody, a different standpoint from where everybody stands. I think you guys are going to love it. But I like the support that you guys have been showing us um, here at the Phoenix 22 Rising Production Studios. So, I'd just like to say thank you on that. Also, a couple updates. What might have been is going to be re-released. We're, we're having it go to some film festivals in California. So we're going to have it re-released with new music from a friend of mine called Holly, uh, Loret Holly Loretta. Is I think the album cover, Holly Loretta is what the album is. It's a friend of mine named um, Holly Russ. 
She makes great albums. I suggest you guys go get it. You can find it on iTunes. And uh, you can go to her website, Holly Loretta, and find it as well on Facebook. Um, we will be releasing what might have been with new tracks from her on there. I think you guys are going to love it. She has great music. I would also like to take this time to let you know that we are doing a, re a reboot on P.S. No Words. Yes, we have finally got the money and the things we need to make this movie the one we've always wanted to make. I think there is a lack of, you know, uh, a, a black scary movie. I think there's a lack, a lack of that with the black scary movie genre. So I just would like to um, make this more of the, the movie I wanted to make the first time. I think you guys are really going to like this one, and I think it's going to really be something that that uh, <laughs> you're going to enjoy. For all the people who are supporting us, I'd like to say thank you. We have really felt your contributions through your digital downloads. I also have had some people who have inboxed me and who told people and friends of mine that they would actually like to see the webisode, the first webisode of the round table. They would like to actually buy it. So for those of you who would like to buy that, I will be putting it up probably within the end of this week. So I'll probably put it on my page, the Facebook page of Phoenix 22 Rising. That's www phoenix 22 risingweeblycom I'll probably put it up for you guys probably near the end of the week. It'll be a $5 digital download and you can have it for yourself. I really appreciate it that you that you liked it that much. We're going to try to keep that coming to you so you can have more good stuff. And for you who are not fans yet or not necessarily dedicated necessarily to buying a $5 digital download yet, it's okay because I'm pretty sure that we're going to have something that you like. We're working hard, we're making new products, we're making movies, we're making, we're making webisodes. I guarantee you we're going to come out with something that you guys are going to love. But for all the other people who have been showing us support, and it has been a lot, especially on the West Coast. West Coast, by the way, I will be back. Burbank, I'm coming home. Um, and the East Coast, I'd like to thank all you guys for showing us love and showing us attention and, and just really being there for us. Uh, there's going to be a whole lot more to come from this company. We're growing every day. And um, I just like to say thanks, so appreciate it, guys. All right, we're back. Thank you for joining us again. Okay, well, basically, um, to sum a lot of this up, I also want to go back to um, the National Guard is now moving into Ferguson under the orders of the governor. So we're going to see how this is going to work out. I would like to say this to the, also the police department in Ferguson. When you guys put tanks on the street and come out in day glow body armor and flash, gray, uh, flash bang grenades and... and uh, <laughs> Look, I understand you have to protect yourselves as a police officer. I understand that. But if you treat a crowd like an animal, you're going to get animalistic behavior. You can't meet aggression with aggression. You are supposed to be peacekeepers. Not Army, not Navy, not Special Ops. Peacekeepers. Keep the peace. Do your job. Remember who pays your salary. That's all I'm saying. Keep the peace. That's all we're saying. Everything doesn't have to be met with deadly force. It doesn't. Get the tanks off the street, please. It's not necessary. We know you want to play with your toys and be a little bunch of Rambos, but come on now. That, really? Tanks? Half of you probably ain't even, you know, know how to use the tank. And now you got these, you know, M16s and, 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 and AK-47s or whatever you're carrying. Really? That, that's not necessary. It's not. It, it's really not. It's kind of sad, actually. Um... So, I'm about to leave y'all guys with my, I guess you could say, my, the last word. And I will get the last word. So, basically, i just like to say, look, to the people in Ferguson, family Mike Brown, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, I'm even sorrier that they're trying to destroy, destroy your son's credibility uh, before we even get into whether we're going to charge this man for murdering your son or not. Uh, but that's how the game is played. It's, it's, it's already started being politics, unfortunately. Who can get the leverage? Um, so I'd like to say I, I'm very sorry for your loss. Uh, you're not alone. You're not alone. Uh, unfortunately, this has happened to a lot of black men and it's continuing to happen to us. 
Um, but like I said, though, I, I think legislation is the best way to go. I think we need to start forming bills. I think we need to make police departments around the U.S. so scared, so frightened to touch a black man in an abusive way that they will think, think two, three, and four times before they do so. The penalty needs to be so severe that they think about it. They really have to think about it before they brutalize us or continue to brutalize us. Because God knows if you touch a dog in this, this country or any other animal, you're going to jail for 10 to 15, no argument. ASPCA, PETA, yeah, we need to get some real-time people in here. Ferguson should not be looking like, like Israel or some battlefield in Iraq. That's ridiculous. It's sad, actually. We go all over the world telling people and removing dictators and telling them, hey, you can't do this to your people, and we're doing it right here at home. We've been doing it right here at home. We've been doing it here for decades. Black people have always been the victims. I've heard that, <laughs> don't play the victims. Hey, once you start shooting at us, we'll stop playing the victims. But yes, no other countries came to America and said, hey guys, you know, you might, <laughs> like, you might need to quit treating your blacks that way. It's not right. But we go all over the world telling people that we're national leaders. But this is what you see at home. This is what's always been here at home. A war zone. I'd like to leave you guys with this. Uh, this comes from, what's this? Oh, this comes from the Onion paper, so I'm quoting them verbatim. All right. Um, so here are tips to being an unarmed black teen in America. All right. Tip one. <laughs> Shy away from dangerous and heavily policed areas. All right. Tip two, avoid swaggering or any other confident behavior that suggests that you are not completely subjected. Number three, be sure not to pick up any object that could be perceived by a police officer as a firearm, such as a firearm, cell phone, food, or any item. Number four, Explain in clear, logical terms that you do not enjoy being shot <laughs> and would prefer that it not happen. Number five, don't let society stereotype you as a pretty normal criminal. Remember that you can be seen as so much more from the armed robber suspect to a rape suspect to a murder suspect. <laughs> Number six, Try to see it from the police's point of view. You may be unarmed, but you're still black. Okay, number seven. Avoid wearing clothes associated with the gang lifestyle. That's very important. Avoid wearing clothes that is associated with the gang lifestyle, such as shirts and pants. Number eight. Reveal in the fact, no, sorry, excuse me, yeah. yeah, revel in the fact that by simply existing, you exert a threatening presence over the nation's police force. Very important. And number nine, final and last, be as polite and as straightforward as possible when police officers are kicking the shit out of you. All right, thank you. That's my show for the day. Uh, you can find me on uh, 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 Facebook. You can get me at Twitter, at Bumgarner, or you can get me at Phoenix22 Rising. Uh, uh, you can also get me on YouTube. All these, uh, all these things will be presented on you at the bottom of the screen. I'd like to thank you guys for having me for this special. We will be back with a round table special. I will have some panels. I will have people on both sides and we will have a great show for you. More importantly, we're gonna educate you and we're gonna keep doing this thing about Ferguson because I want some change to go on. But I'd like to say thank you for having me and uh, God bless. Y'all have a good evening.